But very briefly, um, something we learned last year as the result of a resolution this committee passed a couple years ago um, was that there are co-pays that those who are incarcerated have to pay to go to the infirmary, um, something I didn't know about, which creates a medical debt situation. There's, it's a complicated issue. Um, you know, there's what we have here is people who don't have any other options for medical care. Um, they only can go to the infirmary there, although some people do have support from their families and their account. There's a lot of people who are beyond indigent almost and have nothing in there, and so they're prevented from seeking this care. Um, I have been told that anyone who doesn't have the funds is not turned away, but what ends up happening is people who might have a little bit of money in their account have to make a choice. Do I go to the infirmary for this issue or do I buy clothes or food um, from the commissary for this week? We also have a lot of data um, showing that the lack of preventative care leads to a lot more expensive care later on, especially for the older inmates. Um, it, it, it's something that you know, a lot of us have never really thought about because we have a lot more options to seek medical care. I'm hoping DOC and vote will come up real quick so we won't take much more of your time here. Um, I see you press your button. I'm happy to answer a question while I wait for them. Representative Villio. Thank you. Um, Representative Landry, no defendant or inmate is denied care for an ability to pay, as I understand. And perhaps you should limit your bill to DOC, because I can't really talk about DOC, but I know in local jurisdictions. Um, and let me just say this, as criminal justice director in Jefferson Parish, I was the umbrella agency over the jail. And um, you had inmates that were spending lots of money on candy, chips, you name it. Um, yet my budget was paying for their toothpaste um, for them to watch TV, et cetera. Um, and, and, and they have, to the extent that those individuals have money in their account and, and they are um, provided medical care and dental care <laughs> and particularly outside the facility, um, I don't know why we believe that they should not have to pay a copay. I don't believe that. Um, I agree with you that they should never be denied care. Um, they should, their care should not be delayed. Um, and, and I'm not aware that it is. So I just wanted to make sure that committee members who have not been in that position to understand what really goes on um, and, and I struggle with false narratives all the time. And, and I'm not suggesting that you're intending um, to give a false narrative, but there are a lot of false narratives. And, and so I just wanted to make sure committee members understand Maybe that those inmates are not being real. denied care at, just because they don't have the ability to pay. So I literally just said that right before you spoke that, that I have talked to people um, and they, they claim that that is the case. Sure. The problem is that it's it's sort of a coercive measure if you know you don't have the money. Um, also, painting everyone with a broad brush, saying that some people are buying candy and, and whatever, that everyone can, um, is not accurate either. I mean, we have a really poor state here, and the people who are incarcerated uh, make pennies per hour if they make anything. They rely on family on the outside to put money in their accounts. And while some people may choose potato chips or, or, you know, whatever they choose. That's not everyone who's incarcerated who has that option. Um, I also think on principle that the state has an obligation to provide medical care for the people who are incarcerated for breaking their laws. Um, I know there's a lot of lawsuits about the level of care and what's constitutional, and we're not even getting into level of care here, but, you know, it is our duty to provide that if we are incarcerating someone um, for breaking our laws. Um, but, you know, it's just not everyone not like all of us out here don't have the same, you know, finances or insurance. Not everyone who's incarcerated has the same family support as, as other people. Oh, I, I don't disagree with you that, that not everyone has the same support. It's just I don't want anybody to think here that if you don't have the ability to make a copay that you're in any way denied medical care. And I just want to make sure that was clear. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Villio, Representative Marcel. Thank you. 
Representative Landry, thank you for bringing the bill. I think uh, I understand what your intent is. The question I have is, what is the copay now? It's generally about three to five dollars. Three to five dollars, which seems like nothing to us, but you know, I luckily don't make thirty-nine cents an hour. Although, actually, I'm not going to make a joke about our salaries. Um, I, my understanding is the calculation is the equivalent of charging someone, say, five hundred dollars to go to the doctor when you factor in the the wages, so to speak, that incarcerated people make. Um, part of the discussion we're having with DOC and Natalie Laborde is here is to see if we can find like a lower That's what minimum I amount. Right. That's what I was um, getting right that at that might not be. You know, five dollars and one dollar seem not like a lot to us would but it you, is actually to them would you be open to an amendment that would uh be a compromise say two dollars uh this, so this is natalie here and she can talk a little but we are talking we're trying to come to a uh, an amount um you know I, I think we should do something correct um uh, i i know currently um they are on there's a lawsuit that's currently pending correct and I and I, I want to see what we can do to resolve that and in the interim lower those payments. And I and I do agree that many times, um, for various reasons, the food or whatever, so people do buy potato chips or whatever because the food is uh not tasty. Oh. Uh and so I understand that. And I do understand that sometimes they're they're putting monies in their accounts for even telephone calls to yep. even talk to their children. So everybody, any, any of those funds that go in there could be used for various um, various things and not just candy. So I get that. Uh, I would like to help to move this bill forward with a possible amendment of $2 uh, as a copay, if you would be acceptable to that, and then we could work on it. And I think it's, a, you know, it's heading in the right direction, but I'd like to hear from Ms. Natalie if I, if I could. Yeah, I think that would be best for sure. next. Well, first and foremost, I just really want to highlight Representative Landry and the vote team. We've worked really collaboratively, not only on this bill, but others in the past, especially the safe segregation. We've had a lot of great outcomes on that task force. Um, again, this is something when you have to look at it in context with the overall medical staffing that we have and sometimes the concern and again this is not reflective of the entire population at all but when, when people do abuse the access to it um and so having some caveat for this the uh, whether or not it's a legitimate request and again i i want to be very sensitive to that's usually not the case but also for context the total number of copays charged last year was roughly 140,000. um just you, you mentioned commissary and the total spent, I believe, on that was roughly 17 million. So just to give you a little bit of the, the contrast there, um, again, Secretary, this is something Secretary LeBlanc is personally really working on hard, and he agrees. Um, if we could put a, a, a limit, you know, a cap in law, because there is no cap in law right now. Right now, DOC does it by regulation, and it's six, four, two, depending upon it, what what the, the type of request is. So putting two, um, and then even whether statutorily or in reg, saying if 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 a person has say two hundred dollars or less in their account, they shall not be charged a copay. We already do not charge indigent for indigency. And then third, um, statutorily restricting um, to zero, no copays for prescription drugs. And that's not done always, but that does exist. Um, and that is definitely something that, that we would be in support of as well to eliminate that completely. Thank you, Mr. Laborde. Uh, Representative McCormick. Thank you. I, I guess my question would be, it would cost more than $2 to collect that $2. And, and do we really accomplish anything at the end besides just a lot of red tape? Or, or are you afraid without a copay that will be abused? I mean, what's... Yeah. That is some of the concern, and again, I, I want to be very sensitive to that because I certainly know that that's not reflective of, of the population at all, but you do have some situations in maybe some of the cell blocks where there's less staffing, and individually, if, if it is abused, you have one security officer that's going to have to be escorting back and forth. So that is some of the concern from the staffing popula staffing side of it. I, I don't necessarily think that it, it, it would be... Um, or, or it would negate itself. I mean, we already have a system in place for collecting the copay, so reducing it from what it is to that isn't going to offset it. 
Okay, thank you. That, that is a good question, and, and I've been unable to find the answer because the amount collected is so low. Uh, I tried to work with the fiscal office to see if there was a way to determine the amount of staff hours used to collect okay. this, okay. Um, and I think we couldn't quite get at it, but that's what I was I was wondering myself. Right. Um, and I think in the, the case um, Rep. Marcel mentioned that there's a lot of concern about um, – non-healthcare staff making decisions for whether you can go to the infirmary or not, which is a, a somewhat separate but related issue. So um, that is something that I know the, the judge there is, is looking at. So, you know, a lot, like I said, it's complicated, but that's a very good question. Thank the you. other the other addition I wanted to make you all aware of too is something that, uh, and this has been taken all over the country, a, a change we made um, regarding the concept of malingering. So previously, someone could be disciplined for if they were requesting health care and they, you know, it, it wasn't sincere. But that has been removed, and that's not an appropriate use of, of disciplinary. So that is certainly not something we use now. Um, so that wouldn't be a way to address if it were exploited either way. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members, I'll remind you the author's intent is to voluntarily defer, but you guys have to make a little more. If, if I think there's just one or two more people. They understand your three-minute rule. Um, okay. And, yes, the intent is that we will work this out in the next couple of days with DOC and come back for a vote. Okay. Uh, who, who else would like to come up? Uh, good morning. I, I'll begin, Chairman. My name is Will Harrell. I'm Senior Policy Counsel at VOTE. And uh, – I thank uh, Representative Landry for bringing this bill, and I also thank the Louisiana Sheriff's Association and the Department of Corrections uh, for taking our concerns very seriously. Uh, we're trying to work through uh, a process by which we can accomplish both of our goals, and we do recognize the concerns that have been expressed by the Sheriff's Association as well as DOC that uh, this could uh, create a floodgate of request on an already understaffed medical uh, service. That's the, we're the last people that would be coming here trying to do anything like that, anything that would obstruct people who have legitimate healthcare needs um, from getting those addressed. I believe we've had uh, several years of, of a working relationship with DOC and recently the Sheriff's Association, I'm, I'm pretty confident that between now and next week, we could work it out there's a lot of considerations to take into account um so i appreciate uh representative landry's willingness to defer this bill voluntarily and i hope you all agree to do so until we can work this out um next week but we wanted to go ahead and have this hearing to begin to air out some of these concerns so y'all will be informed and when we come back hopefully we'll have an agreement we won't have to have take up any more of your time on this but we do have two um uh, representatives uh, here on behalf of vote who uh, are formerly incarcerated who one is going to tell you about his situation his personal experience and the other uh, Ronald Marshall is going to uh, talk to you about his observations as a former uh, inmate counsel and we promise to be very very brief thank you thank you so if you'd introduce yourself good morning my name is Ronald Marshall uh, I represent vote I served 25 years in the Department of Corrections during my entire stay, I worked in a law library. Uh, inside the prison, it's like a community. When you do that much time in prison, you go to care for these guys. You go to have a sense of community with them. And I've observed for like 25 years how there's a culture around medical co-pays. And what I mean by that, guys will refuse. So you're dealing with 10, 20, 30 years in prison the support system of a family breaks down. Some guys are in prison living off the land. And when I say living off the land, they are, they are depending on four cents a day, uh, four cents an hour for wages, which equals 32 cents a week. That's nine days of work to pay a $3 copay. They don't have any family. They don't go to visit. They don't make phone calls. They shine shoes to put soups in their box. So like when in the dorms that I lived in, this is what we do. So this is the culture. We're not going to the infirmary because we can't afford to pay. So what guys are doing, listen, man, we're going to put food in your box. Go to the infirmary because if you don't go to the infirmary, you risk everybody in the dormitory getting sick with what you have. That's how bad it is. That's how bad the co-pay discourages guys from getting preventative care. There's, they've got guys that go to the doctor 
pay the copay and get a Tylenol, come back to the dorm with the same sickness, go back to the prison, then from repair another medical copay, get charged, come back with another Tylenol. So they stop going. A week later, this brother dies. That's how bad he, he, he they can't pay the, the the copay prevents guys from getting the help that they need. Simple as that. That's the culture in DOC. That's how the rubble hits the road in DOC. You say in, in society, I don't think no legislator in society would impose a five hundred dollar copay on a family who only makes five hundred dollars a week. That's the reality in prison. And it's even worse because it's four cents an hour, thirty two cents a day. That's nine days of work for the pay $3. That's how bad it is. And if you have someone that's been incarcerated 10, 20, 30 years, their families died off. They're there alone. And they refuse to go to that prison, that infirmary, because they're going to starve. $3, get 10 soups. That's 33 cents a soup. Get 10 soups, put in their body to eat for 10 days. That's how they live in prison. They don't they deny medical treatment, as Representative Video said. No, they're not denied it. But the barrier to the copay and the choice that must be made, that's the problem. DOC is gradually aging. And the longer you're in prison, your support system crumbles. And you're left alone. Everybody has a little hustle in there. And the main thing they focus on at night is having some something to eat to go to sleep on. That's the main focus. And they would eat before they go to that infirmary. And me, myself, and other conscious brothers, what we do was, my, I was fortunate enough to have a supportive family. So if I see somebody sick in the dome, and I know the culture, he's not going to the doctor. I can see him coughing in the dome every day, throwing up mucus, but I know that's the culture of prison. He's not going to the infirmary. I'll put him to the side. Hey, man, listen. Mr. Marshall, I do need you to wrap up. I will. And I said, man, listen. I know you're sick, I know you don't go in the infirmary, you don't have it. I'm going to pay for some of your box. Go in the infirmary and get yourself checked out. And that's, it's, that's, 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 the, that's the culture of prison. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Eugene Dean. I'm also a member of Vote, Varsella Experience. Um, <clears throat> I, too, was incarcerated. Um, I've done 18 years. I've done 18 years. Um, for home robbery, I've been home not 22 years. <clears throat> but at the same token, like uh, Mr. Ronald alluded to, all the things that um, a person incarcerated is faced with is, is, is definitely like 10 times worse. Um, I've been in, when I used to go to the sick call, it was like either I go to sick call or I take the time out and say, I know I'm probably going to get written up. And I'm trying to fight this system and trying to get out of a prison. So this the long-term effects. If I get written up, if I have an opportunity to go up before a board, say, for instance, the pardon board or the parole board, I'm going to neglect my chances of probably making it because of that simple little write-up. And just for everybody that's been said, like Will didn't say it already, <clears throat> And, and Ronald has said it for the sake of time, all of those things are real. And I just asked the, the committee to, to, to investigate it on their own individually and get this information before you make a decision. Um, DOC, like we say, we've been having a great relationships with them, and I think that it's a good bill that Mandy is bringing. And I just hope that y'all have open mind and heart to consider it. Mr. Eugene, I'm not sure that I have a card from you on this bill. Uh, you may not have turned one in. If you could complete a, complete a green card uh, before you leave. Yes, uh, also, President wishing to speak, uh, Jamila Johnson. Okay, Ms. Johnson. At the table already. I will be brief, but um, I wanted to address Representative Marcel mentioned Louis V. Cain, which is the lawsuit. I'm one of the attorneys with Promise of Justice Initiative. I'm their deputy director. But I was also counsel of record in the trial in 2018, 
and the upcoming remedy phase proceeding, which will be in June. I just wanted to quickly read one small section of the court's opinion in March where they found that the state of Louisiana has been in violation of the Eighth Amendment associated with medical care at Louisiana State Penitentiary. And the judge explained that co-pays was one factor that contributes to a delivery system that is, in the court's view, woefully inadequate. I also wanted to add on two other points that were mentioned earlier about um, the amount of compensation in incentive wages and the tie to the copay. Um, for someone who has a disability at uh, Louisiana State Penitentiary, they cannot make for any job more than four cents an hour. Um, for emergency requests, that is 300 hours of work in order to, um, to, to pay for that. So just wanted to add that for the court, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. There are no questions. Uh, we have, um, I believe that covers everybody who was wishing to speak in support of the bill. Uh, Mr. Yancey, present, wishing to speak in opposition? Okay, he'll wave. Uh, and for the sake of time, I think we have 20 uh, green cards in addition. Is there anything else that you'd like to cover, uh, Representative Landry? I just want to say, uh, Rep. Marcel, I'm planning to uh, ask you to, to carry any amendments and help me work through them. I certainly will. Thank you. Okay, I think we have a request now to voluntarily defer, and I will offer that uh, uh, disposition. Is any objection to this bill being voluntarily deferred? Uh, seeing no objection, HB 175 is voluntarily deferred. Thank you, and I will update you on this uh, as soon as we have an amendment. 